so welcome back everybody for another webinar organized by Princeton of, uh, for everybody worldwide. We're very happy to have Johan Swinnen with us. Hi, Johan. Hello. Hi. Good to, good to see you. Thanks. We are looking forward to learn more about global food security in CCC times, times of conflict, con COVID, and climate change. So we're very curious to learn really how we make sure that we have enough food and around the globe uh, in these difficult times. And uh, we had several webinars on oil and gas, and we are now trying to learn more about food. And uh, we have the, one of the three experts in this space, and uh, Johan is from the International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, IFPRI. And uh, before we give the floor to Johan, I will give a few opening remarks. So of course, for global food supply, what matters is the food itself, but also fertilizers. And you have to understand you know, how the markets work. And the food market, the agriculture market is more segmented. So you, of course, you have the four bread baskets of the world with various Ukraine and Russia being involved. But they're not as open as uh, the fertilizer market is much more integrated global market. And the first comment I would like to make is how to think why is it the case that one market is more segmented than the other one? And what does it, what implication does it have for risk sharing? So if you have a segmented market in a very extreme case where you have, you know, the harvest might be low or might be high, so the quantity is low or high, if you're totally segmented in a one single country, the price will be high whenever the harvest is low. And when the harvest is high, the price will be low. So the price and the quantity move in the opposite direction so that the revenue itself stays relatively stable. So it's a good arrangement for the farmers. If they have a bad harvest, the price will be high. And nevertheless, the revenue is still high because the price are high. If they have a lot of harvest, the quantity will be high, but the price low. Uh, but nevertheless, the price doesn't, overall the revenue is no, not moving much. So if you want to ensure farmers, you don't want to have a very open global market uh, in order to have this insurance. That's what we call in economics quasi complete markets. And this famous paper by Cole and Obstfeld uh, are studying this more generally. And particularly if you have Cop Douglas, if customers have Cop Douglas preferences, but then it is the case that the revenue is always the same. The expenditure share stays constant, independent of what the price is. Now, of course, if you have an integrated global market, then it's, it's different because the price is then given by the global uh, conditions, by macro shocks on the global macro shocks. And if they are idiosyncratic shocks, essentially country specific shocks uh, can wash out. And hence you have when the harvest is low, you have a stable price and then the revenue is low. And when the harvest is high, given a relatively stable price, then also the revenue is high. And you can see that, you know, for the consumer, it's more stable. So the, the whole expenditures for the consumers are more stable if you have an open globalized market. Of course, in the current environment, the global price is very high as well. But depending whether you would like to have a very stable situation for the farmers or a very stable situation for the consumers, there are different forces which push for open market versus closed markets. So the farmers would like to have more closed market in order to get this automatic insurance through the price mechanism, while the consumers should in principle like a more open market. Of course, you can have it even differently that you can actually say, oh, whenever the harvest, if the other's harvest is low and the price goes through the roof, I close the borders to protect my consumers and I open the borders whenever my own harvest is very high, is very low. So let inflow come in. So there's an asymmetry and we just have heard that India, of course, is closing its food exports to others. So that's another way that's an interim uh, way, just depending on the circumstances, whether you open or closed and whether the markets are segmented uh, or not. And we will learn about that as too. So that's the first uh, point I would, would like to make. And then the second point is all about resilience. We talked a lot about uh, resilience uh, before, but what are the potential resilience enhancers to make the whole global food supply more resilient? One is, of course, substitutability. How easily can you substitute one food for another food? Or how can you easily can substitute food in a particular location and move it over to another location? So if you have better transport infrastructure, and that's essentially what's lacking at the moment, bringing the, the wheat out of Ukraine. And uh, so the transport infrastructure gives you more resilience, but also information sharing and coordination 
among uh, the various food producers and food consumers. And the ability to scale up locally, if you suddenly have the ability to scale up, and in many countries like in the European Union, there's an artificial creation of scarcity of food, perhaps we can undo that and scale up uh, now. Another element I think probably which we'll really talk about is can we change our eating habits, in particular given that the demographics, we have a population growing to more than 8 billion people and so forth, do we have to substitute our meat uh, consumption for meat substitutes or more vegetables or insects? Can we actually change our eating habits with some apps where we monitor how much CO2 emissions certain consumption, certain dinners create, and there might be some interesting uh, innovation coming on. And then we have all these new technologies in farming coming on, like vertical farming, where instead of having plants on the field, we have them in big, in, in big factories where you can have uh, uh, the vegetables growing uh, vertically um, on different layers in big high rises. Now with this, uh, let me just jump to the poll questions uh, you answered. And the first question was out of these three Cs, um, you want to present, uh, what's most challenging? Climate change for the food security, or is it COVID, or is it the conflict or the war in Ukraine uh, in particular? And the answers were 63% thought it's mostly climate change, 9% COVID, and 28% thought it is uh, the conflict of war in Ukraine. It's just one example. There might be many more conflicts. Uh, uh, coming up or we are facing conflicts. Second question is, what would make the global food supply most resilient? Is it to go for autarky, or go for vertical farming and other technologies, invest in infrastructure for transport, for example, or use more eco-friendly fertilizers or more fertilizers or also genetically modified food, which is controversial in Europe, uh, and or to change the food habits uh, with apps. So the answers for that and you're probably not surprised given most of the audience are economists. Go for auto key was nobody was voting for that. Uh, vertical farming is 16%, invested infrastructure was 44%. So that's what the big hope is. What's about eco-friendly and more fertilizer, use of fertilizers also in the developing world, GMO food and so forth, 22% uh, and change in food habits, uh, almost 20%, so 19% of change in food habits. And finally, Food shortages in a few months, in the fall, when the harvest season, and we are short on food. Will it be a problem or not? Perhaps we can manage it. That's what actually 19% thought. We can actually manage it. But 72% thought it will lead to social unrest. So this was a question you can pick more than one answer. And 47% thought it will lead to migration movements. So the social unrest is, you know, 70% huge number thought it will lead to social unrest, potentially at least in other developing countries. But we will learn now much more from an expert. These are just some initial thoughts to stimulate uh, the development. And so we're very much looking forward to, to learn from one of the leading experts in the field, how, what situation we will face and perhaps we how the best mask can master it, or at least manage the situation. Thanks again for doing it. And uh, the floor is yours and I will share the slides. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, glad to be uh, with you today. Um, it's uh, uh, These are very special times, CCC times, uh, COVID, conflict, and climate change. And um, I will go through each three of these factors. The, um, let me just say a few words up front, okay? So IFPRI is International Food Policy Research Institute. Our website is, is easy, it's www.ifpri.org. And so on the website of the Institute, you can find uh, a whole series of, of data, of indicators, of reports as well. And so our policy is to make these available uh, for free. And so those of you who are interested, I, I just want to make this up front. I have a, a slide at the very end where uh, basically there is some information on that. But uh, <clears throat> just to let you know already, feel free to take a look there. And if there's uh, interesting material on, on specific issues that I will talk about, uh, you can find it there. 
on the we have a special blog base on the Ukraine war and its implications for global food security, which has about uh, 20 to 30 blogs we add almost every day, both uh, general, I mean, uh, global effects, but also country specific effects, etc. Um, etc. Just to give you a thing there and just uh, check around the website if you want. The other thing is that my I have a slide deck here, which has probably more slides than I will be able to cover in the, uh, the time that we have available here today. But I thought just to leave them all in, I will skip a few slides here and there, but they're available. There's also references there from which study they come. Uh, uh, so I'll be using a lot of our own, uh, our own uh, research uh, material or research output, if you want. Okay, let's take a, a look back. So this is an, um, the cover of an, uh, an issue of The Economist from June 2013, so uh, eight years ago. And uh, the main article, the lead article in The Economist and the cover page is based on that is uh, called Towards the End of Poverty. Okay, so it has data there from 1985 roughly until 2013 and it's extrapolated by you see in a very scientific way <laughs> by, the, by the drawer the person who drew the, the cover and essentially arguing that soon within a decade or two decades maybe from 2013 there will be no more poverty in the world and so that was perfectly consistent with the evolution that we saw if you look at hunger next slide please there we see the same thing and so in the hunger numbers, these are the standard numbers that are produced by FAO every year. We see that we see actually remarkable progress. OK, and so this is the, the data which I had over this period. And the, the, even if you look at the long, if you go further back, it's very much in line with the picture on, on the left hand side. So the cover could have talked about towards the end of hunger as well. OK, so both if you look at, at the millions, so the number of people goes from even in this in this 10 year period from 825 to 628 i mean that's huge right 200 million people less and if you look at percentages the decline is very strong as well and then things change and here you see the uh, the recent numbers and there you see that basically almost at the moment that the economist comes out with that art with that article that basically things stabilize and then things uh, turn around in the in a very in a negative way okay and so we see that both the percentage of people having hunger and the number of people having hunger is increasing very significantly so these numbers go up to 2020 which is uh, before COVID-19 okay and so the point I'm going to make in a second or in, the, in a minute is that COVID-19 has made things worse even after that if we look then at uh, is this um, caused by a particular one particular region or something or what may happen there, the answer is no. So you see here the different group, you see the world numbers on the left, and then you see for Africa, Asia, Latin America, and, and the Caribbean, and you see in all these regions, you see that the number of people in, in food insecurity has uh, grown significantly over this period. So it's a global phenomenon, really. So I'm going to show you, uh, I'm first going to go in a little bit more detail on, on these numbers, and then I'll, I'll uh, basically pr provide some hypotheses about what's behind this. First, um, you know, economists traditionally have, have, focused, have focused very much on, or development economists, on, on hunger and poverty, okay? And so this is what is now into much of the work, much of the discussions, what we have today is about what's called food systems, okay? And food systems is a much broader concept. And so the poverty and the hunger one would be here in the health and inclusiveness area. So inclusiveness in means, right, it's uh, or the, the poor included in, in, the, in the, the food system development, food system transformation, but also are, if there's gender issue, there is ethnic issues there, etc. Health includes of course you need enough calories to survive but health is much broader it's also about the types of uh, food that we eat the nutrition much more about the quality as well of the food and then issues such as uh, resilience and sustainability these are issues which are obviously really important but they've kind of been part of this much more broader 
focus we are taking now on food systems transformation compared to let's say our the traditional focus on, on hunger and, and poverty just to give you a couple of numbers on the on these things okay if you look at malnutrition in a more precise uh, uh, definition if you want uh, then we see that and also a more uh, uh, let's say not this this simple indicator or of being hunger of having hunger you see that the numbers are much bigger right so uh, the numbers i was just showing you earlier were somewhere between 600 and 800 million people if you look at whether people can afford a healthy diet and so healthy diets been identified or defined by by some uh, international institutions then you see that three billion people cannot afford a healthy i mean that's a large share of the people on this planet if you look then more narrowly on micronutrient deficiencies even there the number is two billion people so it's it's really i mean a much bigger number and a large share of our population and then we have this other development where people are consuming too much food or too much unhealthy food, which is captured by obesity indicators, which is also now put at roughly uh, 2 billion people. And then uh, you see that a third, the left hand panel, the, the figure there, the, the, the map shows uh, the, the combination of being of countries facing both undernutrition and, and obesity problems. And you see that about a third of the lower and middle income countries face the, com the combined problems of undernutrition and obesity. So it's really a very, very significant problem that we face, that the world faces today. This is, uh, I put this slide in uh, just to illustrate the point that, and this is, I'm, I'm sure you're not surprised by this, but that within countries there's really a large heterogeneity in terms of, of the nutritional quality and the health problems so this these are data from nigeria and here you see on the right hand uh, the right hand column that's the reference diet so this is a healthy diet according to a study which is now often used to eat lancet uh, report okay and so there you see by different uh, categories of uh, of commodities within the food uh, it more, more broadly you see this is what we should eat to have a, a healthy diet and uh, so the left hand column is the total for nigeria the average for nigeria and then the first the second column is the lowest income group in nigeria and the third column is the highest income group from uh, nigeria and you see there's huge variations between both right actually if you look at fats and sugars the one could say that the uh, the poorest people in Nigeria are the closest to the Eat Lancet diet, okay? But they eat too much uh, cereals, uh, according to, to the reference here. On the other hand, if you look at the highest income group, you see that the total uh, grams per day are roughly the same as the, the, the global reference diet, but that there is significantly too much or substantially too much fats and sugar. Although on the cereals level here, they are uh, uh, have about roughly the same thing. So a lot of variation within countries uh, also, which I'm sure is not surprising to you. Then uh, another slide I put in just to give you a feeling uh, about this. We have generally, um, I think a, a point is that most of the discussion has been about how the um, climate change is affecting our, our food systems, okay, or particularly our agricultural production, et cetera. But the fact that the food system is, is a very strong contributor to climate change and to resource problems globally has been somewhat underemphasized. And particularly, I think, at the, polit uh, at the policy level, if you look at the focus of, of COP26 and the COPs before on food systems, it has been relatively marginal. While if you look at the numbers, OK, uh, the food systems really deserve a much more uh, a much stronger focus and a much more prominent place i think on, on the policy discussions around that these are some numbers from the these are from the eat lancet report again but some of the other estimates actually put the greenhouse gas emissions from the food system significantly higher than this so the estimates vary from this one has it around 23 percent to as high as 35 percent so that means that potentially one third of all the greenhouse gas emissions actually come from the food system. And that of course means that the food system should be central in our discussions about uh, 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 climate change and in, in that way. And of course, it's a bilateral, a, a bi-directional uh, relationship. 
okay and as you can see from uh, so the different colors here indicate to some extent to what extent it's due to crops production livestock production and then also fisheries uh, and, and particularly processing and distribution okay which play a, a very important role in, in the retail sector as well can, can you right. explain why, why in the developing world suddenly it became less CO2 efficient if, or it's just the quantity went up? I think it is mostly a classification issue, okay? Mm -hmm. And so it's a very simple classification issue of, uh, so there's no emerging countries in there. So China, India, etc., are here in the developing uh, uh, okay. country uh, category. So it's a very crude uh, distribution of, of, uh, of classification of countries. So I think that's the most important reason that the emerging countries have been growing very significantly and as a consequence have also uh, basically expanded their, their uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, okay? And so developed countries have declined a bit, but not that much, it's almost the same over 30 years. Let me then, uh, what I've had, I have uh, three slides here, which correlate the, uh, the increase, the turnaround in uh, the, the malnutrition indicators to so the hunger indication with a number of factors around the world. So this is the climate change indicator on the right hand side. This is the, what is measured as the, the global temperature anomaly, basically the divergence from before and clearly over the past decade, you see this go up significantly. And that is the, the, the time also that the hunger num numbers uh, turn around. There are a number of potential mechanisms uh, through which this can occur. This can occur through droughts, through floods, uh, and through uh, other mechanisms that are there. Okay, we'll, we will discuss this a bit further later on. The, what is um, a bit less emphasized, but I think really important, is actually the main indicator still of, of hunger in the world is income, right? And so you see clearly that over the same period that the low and middle income incomes or the growth per capita numbers in low and middle incomes have gone down somewhat that's by the green line on, on the right hand panel you see that but particularly in sub-saharan africa the poorest part of the low and middle income countries there you see that that growth numbers on average have actually turned negative and this is i mean it's uh, again okay these are very raw these are correlations that you see but their correlations are, are they're strong that particularly in this period where uh, income levels have gone down, uh, growth levels have gone down, that the number of uh, undernourished people in the world has gone up also. The next slide is, um, this is from a recent book, okay, that just came out on, it's called Food for All, and there it presents data from uh, work which has been done by USDA and, and, and Washington here. And so it shows how uh, TFP, so total factor productivity growth has evolved for different countries. And you see that uh, at the same period when uh, the growth, uh, the per capita growth has fallen very strongly, that also the TFP growth has very uh, fallen very strongly. And this is of course, when we think about structural reasons for what's going on and, 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 and looking forward, okay, this is a very worrisome uh, set of observations. This is uh, probably also a bit less well known. And so this is the number on the right hand uh, panel here of what's called forcibly displaced people worldwide. So these are people who have to leave their, their house, their village, their, their region because of conflict. Okay, And some stay within the same country, some basically migrate across borders. But there's a very significant, you see that from 1990 till 2013 or something, that the number fluctuated a bit, but it was around 40 million uh, people okay, on, on, uh, per year. And you see that number has almost doubled over the, the second part of the decade. And so this again is very strongly correlated with the uh, increase in hunger numbers. And we know that refugees and, and, and uh, yeah, conflicts in, in terms of basically have, forcing people to leave their village, their fields as well, if they're farmers, uh, is very strongly, uh, is a very important reason for acute malnutrition. So here, this is now, so every year now, since a couple of years, there is a global report on food crises. 
uh, that comes out and uh, my institute if we is, is doing uh, background uh, research for, for this report and so you see if you look on the right hand side there you see that this is done a, a bit more I would say scientific if you want compared to the correlation indicators that I just showed you and so and, and here we talk about food crises so this is an even tighter number tighter uh, indicator than, than, than hunger or malnutrition and there, uh, this, re this report, because it's annually, try to estimate what is the, the cause of this. And you see that conflict, weather events, these are related to climate change or not, depends, uh, and economic shocks. And in 2020, those economic shocks were important related to COVID. We've seen that, all, or we see from these numbers that all these three factors are really important uh, causes of uh, the, the many millions of people uh, being driven into food crisis situations. Uh, and of course, the numbers vary a bit over the year, but conflict and, and insecurity varies between, I mean, it's around from, it's from 75 till 100, roughly it is, so it's, it's really large. And again, this was before the Ukraine crisis, et cetera. But it seems like the weather events went down in a sense. Oh. Yeah, but I think the, the weather events is, you know, there's slight fluctuation. I mean, and weather is variable, right? And so it, it may fluctuate from, so I think there the issue is, is much more what the average is over time, I think, rather than uh, you can have a, a really big weather shock in one year and much less yes. in the next year, I think. So the overall trend might be the other way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, looking back in five years, it may be that 2020 was just a, an outlayer and from the mm -hmm. overall effect, I would say. What I'll do now, I'll go through a few uh, slides. Uh, we've done at, at IFPRI, we've done a lot of work on the impact of COVID-19 on global food security. Uh, we actually have two books, uh, books reports out. And again, they're on our websites. You can download them for free there, or you can also find reference to the studies. This one is um, our global modeling exercise where we um, calculate the impact on global poverty. And so as you see here, the number roughly uh, 150 million people um, basically were pushed into poverty uh, as a consequence of COVID-19. What is interesting is that our earlier estimates had the number of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, significantly higher and the number of South Asia significantly lower. We had to revise these things and I'm sure some of you, you may have had uh, previous seminars on this, et cetera. Why? the impact on Sub-Saharan Africa has been a bit lower or lower than expected and South Asia higher. There's a number of uh, studies coming out on this as well now. On the right hand panel, this is the impact on nutrition and this is what economists would predict, uh, namely that what you shift when people's income falls, what you see, you see a shift from uh, more expensive food, which is typically more nutritious, such as fruits and vegetables, animal products, uh, to cheaper food, which is less nutritious, but uh, basically provides you the calories to survive and then basically allows you to buy the food when you have lower incomes. And so that is, so these were simulation effects. And so in the next slide, I will show you some of our, our measures on, on, on uh, what we actually uh, found there. Um, the, so essentially, let me just show you. To, so we did a number of studies in, in various countries. And so what we show, what we find is indeed based on our household surveys, that what, what we predicted was actually true, that the income effects had been strongest for the poorest households in uh, society, and that the nutrition effects was also strongest for the poorest households in society. Okay. And so the, the there's a number of reasons why poorest people why have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And so here I have listed six uh, different reasons, actually. And so the, the first one is something we know very well, is that poor households spend the largest share of their incomes on food. And uh, something, this is very well known factor, okay. Another factor is that uh, what's, what makes, I mean, the poor people, what do they have? Well, they don't have land, they don't have capital, what they have is their own labor, okay? And this is physical labor. So typically low skilled physical labor, that means you have to go out of the house, uh, be there to actually work. And so this use of your main production factor has been constrained both by the, uh, by the disease itself 
and by all the regulations, obviously, to control the disease. Okay. We also seen that, and this so the, the, the labor intensity also works to affect their, their access to food. We see that food value chains, uh, which are more labor intensive, typically in developing countries, have been mostly have been more disruptive because of the labor intensive nature of the of the value chains. And that uh, poor people typically depend more on or rely more on, on social programs, nutrition programs, school feeding programs, for example. And these, these have also been uh, disrupted. We know that they have typically less access to health services. And then within this group of poor people, uh, women, children, and what I refer here to as ex-migrants. So that essentially means people who have to go uh, travel for work. People. For example, rural households where uh, members of the household go to the cities to work or where uh, members of the household have to are working in other countries. And so remittances have typically been very strongly affected by COVID-19. So in terms Next of part. the food, the food value chains, they're probably shorter these value chains for poorer people than because they consume mostly grain rather than meat, which has a much longer food value chain. Is this correct? Or? Uh, yeah, I'll come back later on the value chain issue, but in general, the well, obviously, when you're in the, in the rural areas, right? So, and the, the the let's say they produce cassava or something in the village, and you can buy it. Clearly, this is less affected than when you have to move the product to the cities. But the the the, the impact has been much more heterogeneous, I would say. I mean, um, let's how should I say this best? It's uh, uh, for a lot of the, the food that, that uh, particularly the, the, the urban consumers in developing countries, I mean, uh, for them, the supply chains are quite long as well, because the food has to come from the urban, uh, from the rural regions, right. or comes in through the ports, etc. So it's a bit more complicated than that. So here is the, uh, <laughs> this is what I just said, okay, so this is data from Ethiopia. And so the poor people, you see on the left-hand panel, poor people have suffered more from income declines than middle and richer households. And so they have suffered more from nutrition, negative nutrition effects, okay? In this case, the data there is the, the uh, consumption of dairy products, which is an indicator of high quality uh, nutrition in Ethiopia. And this is data from Addis Ababa. And you see that the after the COVID hit, that the, first of all, the poorest were already consuming less dairy products and the middle income. And there is a significant decline while in the richest household, the, the decline is very small. Okay. So the next two slides, I have data on how public services have been disrupted. These are data from a study we did in India. And so here you see clearly that a, a number of, of service programs, this is for mothers in, in India, young mothers, and you see, uh, so the blue bar is before COVID-19 and the green and yellow bars is after COVID-19. And you see uh, things like immunization services, growth monitoring for babies, counseling on health and nutrition, all these have been very heavily affected. The one on the right hand side, the public distribution food ration, there you see that this has gone up. And this is an interesting uh, observation. So in many countries, what we've seen is that public programs, actually food safety, uh, sorry, uh, uh, food, uh, pr food protection programs, if you want to, to support the poorest people, uh, social protection programs have uh, been expanded quite significantly in several countries. And so I think this is a, an, an, a positive observation, which potentially medium and long-term effect, because once these systems are put in place, they tend to uh, to stay there. And so I think that's an, an, a positive effect. Here is data from, these are from Nigeria and Africa. And you see pre-COVID that we had, um, uh, first of all, the, the, the numbers are much bigger on the right-hand side post-COVID than on the left-hand side. And in this case, higher numbers are bad. Okay, so skipping a meal, running out of food, not eating for a day, they're all much higher after COVID than before. What we also see is that the difference between the blue and the green bar is, uh, is very small in the post-COVID period 
and is larger in the pre-COVID period. And this is the effect of uh, school feeding services and so how it's affecting the, the, the situation. And you see that the situation is worse and the impact of these programs has fallen away, uh, importantly. Because schools were closed down at that time? Or? Yeah, all the school feeding, yeah, schools were closed down. What we've seen though, and I'll come back to that a, a bit later, is that um, there's been a lot of innovation, okay, in value change in general, okay, but also in public systems in the sense that when um, the, the food would still arrive as part of the program to the schools that uh, basically local organizations or the schools itself try to set up systems to bring the food to the households where the children would normally get it in the mm -hmm. school, but if the school was not open, that they would try to get it to the, the, the schools, school children, even if they would not come to school. Okay, so a lot of entrepreneurial activities there which I think was also one of the positive things we've seen out of COVID-19. And this data, that survey data, and you conducted the surveys? surveys yeah. or? Okay. These are all done. So the, in this case, the, the paper is by Abbey et al. 2021 is on the right hand tab. So it's a, an if pre oh, okay. right. Yeah. Yeah, so as I said already, women have been uh, especially vulnerable. Uh, we've done quite a bit of uh, work on this. And so th the key point is they're vulnerable for a number of reasons. One is that um, their income shocks are typically uh, are affecting women and, and uh, men differently in, in the households. That's what we observe empirically. And of course, it's and that is affecting then the empowerment of women and particularly the, the, the schooling of children in general, I would say, uh, but particularly of girls, okay? And so this, we know very, that from many studies that uh, schooling is really a very important factor determining uh, people's capacities later, their skills and their potential to participate in labor markets later. And this clearly is affecting the, the next generation. So. And so the point here is that given those, the fact that, that women and girls are particularly affected, that if we have set up policies and, 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 and programs that we should anticipate these things and build this in into the programs to uh, work uh, to basically adapt the policies and social protection, target women, uh, use uh, complementary programs in these in food, nutrition, water, sanitation, health, etc., to deal with that. So okay. let's suppose we didn't have the war in Ukraine would you think it would come back to normal levels in the next few years or do you think COVID would last and damage well the, the food supply issue oh and the women sorry say that again so do you think uh, if uh, if we didn't have the war in ukraine how long would COVID drag on and really lead to malnutrition for many people well uh, the the main factor okay the way it has affected uh, uh, poor people's income is actually true true income losses and true employment mm -hmm. losses okay? okay and those are uh to some extent these are permanent but they can also for very poor people they can push them through kind of a threshold okay. where they have to use up assets and therefore this has permanent uh, longer term permanent effects okay so here this is a survey we did this is from myanmar and so here we ask households how has COVID-19 affected you? And so one of the issues we've heard a lot about was how value chains, supply chains were disrupted, okay? And I think one of the factors which we had, I mean, I think many of with us, we saw all these media reports about crops rotting on the field, trucks in line at the border couldn't move, and, 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 and stories about uh, uh, supply chain disruptions. And these have occurred, no doubt. I mean, it's, it's clearly documented. But relatively speaking, they have been uh, much less important than just economic effects in terms of losses of income and losses of jobs. Okay. And so when on, on the supply chain side, there we have talked to many, uh, basically multinationals, but also traders in villages in developing countries, etc. And what you see across the board has been a massive amount of, of innovations in value chains. Innovation in terms of institutional innovations, the uh, management innovation, but also technological innovations. You see, there's been a lot of digital technology being introduced in global supply chains, even in relatively 
poor environments, etc., much more than what uh, than we had anticipated or had predicted, actually. And so I think that also is is really a very interesting conclusion if you think about resilience of our food systems that people are very entrepreneurial are very innovative when it when they have to and actually can do it in a relatively short time and we talked to business people and they said you know we had a plan for for example digital innovation for the next 10 years we introduced it in six months because we had to okay and even in in uh, and of course the, the nature of the digital innovation shift but even in lower uh, income countries, we've seen a lot of that happening. The um, here is just a, a quick point before I'm moving into Ukraine and Russia. Um, the, what's interesting is that the if we look along the food value chain, okay, we see that the most uh, the strongest effect have been at the service level, if your food service. So this is in the urban areas, right? Processing can be part of it in rural areas, but often also in, in urban areas. And farming obviously is in, in agriculture in, in, the, in the rural areas. But we know that most of the poor people in the world live in uh, rural areas. And so there's been two compensating effects, if you want, or compensatory is not the, maybe not the right word, kind of uh, two effects. One is that uh, so clearly farming has been disrupted. Minus 14% is significant in any world except in the COVID world, if you want. And so there you see that um, rural areas have been significantly affected. So they saw an increase in poverty because a lot of poor people live there. But the, but the impact was much stronger in rural areas. And there, but fewer poor people live in, sorry, it was much stronger in urban areas, but fewer people live in urban areas. And those factors have worked together to the fact that there's been the impact has been quite similar in in uh, rural and urban areas you see they kind of compensate each other in, in terms of making this effect uh, similar across the the, uh, the different regions of the country okay let me then move to um, Ukraine and, and Russia these are um, data I'm, I'm making the link here via trade okay and also because you had this question on on this i'll talk to you a good solution these are data so these are trackers that we have on in terms of trade restrictions that country have introduced and so these are particularly uh, restrictions that food exporting countries have been introducing to uh, protect their own consumers for food leaving the country okay so these are traditional exporters and what's very interesting is that these are from three recent crises, if you want. So we had a big food price spike in 2008, which people in the food world know. They said this is the food price crisis of 2008. And so this, this is the yellow line. And there you see that within a couple of weeks, about uh, 25 to 30 countries had introduced these uh, restrictions. Then we had, a, and so they remained for the rest of the year. So the, the, the axis here is weeks of the year. And so interestingly, all the shocks happened at the beginning of the year. <laughs> it was like we did not have to correct even for that. Then COVID-19, uh, two years ago, same thing. Okay, you see the blue line there, very strong increase in uh, export restrictions. What's interesting then, in the 10 years in between, uh, the international organization, IFPRI was involved, had set up a number of better monitoring systems. So we had better information about the stocks that were available, that were there, better predictions of what would, or better ways, actually, better models to predict grain harvest, etc. And so we were able in 2020 to convince all these governments, say, listen, what you did in 2008 just made things worse. By export restrictions, prices increased further on global markets, creating more trouble. And so, and basically the IMF, the World Bank, FAO, etc., uh, OECD came up and said, please do not do that, get rid of the export restrictions, and countries followed the advice. What we see now, and that's the blue line, is that there's been significant export restrictions, and so far uh, our pleas have had not much impact because they're, they're still there in terms of things, and hopefully we can get them to reduce the export restrictions so that will remove some of the pressure on, on the global markets. Okay. The, um, here you see that the, the key line here is the green line on the left hand. And so this for 60 years of data. And you see that before the war started even, 
that the real food prices were very high in, in historical terms. Okay. And so you see they were at their highest, even higher than in 2008, where I just referred to. And so this was uh, before the start of the war. And what's also true is that for most of the basic uh, commodities like wheat, uh, corn, etc., barley, the stocks were low in historical perspective. The only exception is rice. Okay, and we'll see that rice performs very differently. Rice is also a commodity which is not exported by Ukraine or Russia. And there the stocks were relatively high. As you know, Russia and Ukraine are both major exporters of, uh, uh, of, of a number of key commodities, such as barley, maize, sunflower, sunflower oil, wheat. Okay. And so they are basically roughly 66% each in the global market sharing calories. And there you see what happened to prices. And this is the most, well, some of the most recent numbers that you see there. You see the big price spike is when the, the invasion happened. Uh, where you see meat prices jumping up, uh, maize prices jumping up, and the rice prices, which is the, uh, the green line, have performed very differently. Okay, so saying uh, below the level of, of two years ago, even. I mean, there's been some upward pressure but not significantly in, uh, in the uh, local prices in, in uh, countries like India and China, et cetera. So to what extent can you substitute uh, wheat and maize with rice? Is this difficult uh, because eating habits are so different or is it? Yeah, it's surprising yeah. that the rice price went down. Yeah, but the, it's, it basically has to do with consumption habits. Yes, absolutely. That's the main thing. And so for like for <laughs> for me or you, maybe, I mean, whether you have a bowl of rice or, or basically something or, 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 or based on French rice or whatever, doesn't really make that much difference. But if you look at it from consumption habit at an aggregate level from different countries in the world, it really makes a big difference. Yeah, that's main. Thing. And is it also difficult to transport rice from one continent to another one? Or is this also explaining why the, the substitutability is not easy? No, it's not so hard to transport. I mean, there's a lot of rice trade in the world going on. That is not okay. really a problem. Okay. And so you see on the left hand side that particularly it's the countries really close to Russia and Ukraine, which is mostly affected, particularly in the north of Africa and the east of Africa there. Um, I have actually slides on the next slide, which is from Egypt. And there you see that Egypt is, I mean, their bread, uh, wheat is really a staple commodity and they import a huge amount of it, okay? And so what's interesting over this period, this is 20 year period, you see that 20 years ago, they were much less dependent on Russia and Ukraine for wheat imports or for imports in, in general, I would say. So the imports have doubled over that period and almost all of it is coming from Russia and Ukraine now. And that obviously makes them extra vulnerable. So it seems like Turkey is dependent too on, on from this picture here. Sorry? Turkey is also quite dependent on Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, that is for uh, imported calories. That's for a number of, uh, I don't know exactly for which commodity that is. I would have to look into it. Sorry. No, no, no problem. So the next slide has a, maybe a summary on, on some of the, the points. Here. And I think, the, first of all, it's, it's surprising the, the, the correlation between the food prices, the fuel prices, and the fertilizer prices over this period, OK? And so, or maybe striking is the right, the better word than, than surprising. But they are very strongly correlated. The other thing what you can see is that when we talked about 2007, 2008, you see a very strong increase over the, of the years before. We talked about the price shock. mean, And shock means it's compared to a, a reference of stability. And so when it increases very strongly, it has a shock to it. If you look now, I mean, over this, I mean, the, the, the normality here is, is actually fluctuation and volatility. So I think we have to start thinking about these markets in ways of, of being a volatility as the norm rather than as the exception. And this brings us to the point of resilience. Okay, how do you deal with that? I think the problem right now is, is we're in a worse situation than we were in 2007, 8 because 
uh, we become just out of still in COVID really, but that means governments have expanded, have really uh, uh, are basically are affected by the amount of expenditures they've had on health services, et cetera, because of COVID. Same thing at the household level, we'll just show you how COVID has really uh, contributed importantly to hunger already there. And we've seen this turnaround, which is structural. So all these things kind of combined. These are the CCC times really hitting us us very strongly. Let me, because I'm uh, almost used up the time, let me go further to, um, so here is, if you look at the fertilizer market and here, the, so the, green, the, the red uh, part is the, the share of Russia. And you see it's between 14% and 90% in all the trees. So these are the main components of, of uh, fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphate, and potash. And so Russia is important. And uh, in each of these three uh, fertilizer markets, you also see that in uh, nitrogen and phosphate, uh, China is a very important player. And China has introduced some export restriction on fertilizer already before the Ukraine war, I mean, about a year ago. Um, and then on potash, particularly Belarus, which is also part of our sanctions, uh, I mean, affected by sanctions by the European Union uh, for related but different reasons, uh, is a main exporter of, of potash. We have now the, the, maybe a word on the sanctions issue, the uh, both the US and, and European uh, countries have, uh, so, fertilizer or food are actually not affected by sanctions as commodities but it's very difficult of actually to to separate these out and the reason is that the uh, while the commodities themselves are um, basically are not affected by the sanctions or not included in the sanctions some of the companies who are dealing with or trading in this are mm -hmm. affected by the sanctions and that makes the implementation of the exception a quite complicated thing okay and so many western companies don't want to try to trade it because they're affected that they may make some error in dealing with some companies and then be affected anyhow. Okay. And is there any ability of, of other countries stepping in and expanding their production capacity or it's very difficult, it's a huge time lag to scale up? Yeah, there is. Uh, so the investment, I mean, we're talking about building new fertilizer production facilities is or something, it's really a multi-billion dollar investment. So it's a it's, it's a lot of money and it takes time to do it. But there are a number of uh, countries which are in, in which were already invest, uh, building facilities such as Nigeria, India, etc. Mm -hmm. And so the, there is potential there to expand that uh, in, in the shorter run rather than start thinking about building whole new facilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Marcus, I think I'm going to end here. Maybe the last slide is. Uh, on, uh, I come back to the, I'm just going to skip this one for time reasons. So here is the longer term perspective. You see, if you see the, the, the amount of progress that we made. And so the question we are facing now is, can we hopefully go back to the green line, the green arrow, if you want, and not to the red arrow. And then of course, this is something we're all working on. We hope we can turn this around. But at this point, the, the, the situation doesn't look very uh, optimistic, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And then the very last line is just a slide is just uh, from our website where you can find indicators and, and uh, information if you are interested. That's it. Thanks a lot, uh, Johan. This was fascinating. There's a lot of data and probably a lot of things to read up and dive deeper. I think you gave a great overview of all the things which are the first order importance. And one final question. Do you think the interaction makes it even worse? So is the conflict and the climate change, is it worse than just having at least some of the two, or is it just uh, you know interacting in a way which makes the whole interaction even worse? We have all three Cs together working. Yeah, I think particularly from, well, I, I think some of it, uh, I think for the poorest people, okay, it makes it worse. Okay, because it keeps pounding on it. It's really an, an additional factor. And, you know, typically poor people don't have the, the, the skills, the insurance systems, the finance to basically protect themselves very well in the resilience perspective. On the other hand, what I think what, what COVID has really learned us, and which I think is 
is the, the resilience of some of the supply chains, okay? Also mm -hmm. the entrepreneurship of people, uh, some of the also, and, and I think both in, on the private sector side, but also on the public sector side, you've seen a lot of, of, of innovations, I think in public uh, programs, et cetera, which I think is, is a very positive thing as well. And so in that way, kind of the things we have, people have done both public sector, private sector in responding to COVID may also become uh, play an important role or be reinforcing in their in their reactions to other crises. I think going forward. Thanks a lot. I know that you have a hard deadline, and we stretched it already a little bit. It was fascinating, and I hope we can follow up on this and talk more about these topics. I very much appreciate uh, your presentation, and this is actually the last one before the summer break. So the summer break is starting now for us, and. Uh, and you can still watch it on YouTube and um, have a nice summer, everybody. And thanks again to Johan Svenen who gave us this great overview of what's going on in the food dimension. Okay. Bye-bye. Wonderful.